What if your home could run entirely on sunlight? I'm Tor Allen of the Rahus Institute, standing on the National Mall in Washington, D.C., where 18 solar homes have been built as part of an international competition. Join me as we explore this village where every home is a solar home. The Solar Decathlon is a uh, competition sponsored by the Department of Energy um, in which there's 18 universities that, that uh, compete to design, build, and operate the best solar house. The National Mall in Washington, D.C. is often called America's Front Yard, a two-mile expanse of open parkland running west from the Capitol Building toward the Washington Monument. It was here that the first Solar Decathlon was held in the fall of 2002 and followed three years later by Solar Decathlon 2005. The Decathlon is divided into ten separate contests. The first is architecture. Teams are judged on the design and construction of their houses and also on how well their solar technology fits into their designs. Second is dwelling, which judges the livability and buildability of the homes. Will they work well for everyday use? And would people want to buy them? The third contest is documentation. Designing and building a solar home requires many plans, drawings, and documents. A group of architects and engineers reviews this paperwork. Fourth. The communication contest looks at the team's websites and their house tours to see how well they communicate what they've done. The fifth contest, Comfort Zone, requires each house to stay at a comfortable temperature and humidity. The sixth contest is Appliances. Student teams have to wash and dry clothes, cook meals, use a dishwasher, and keep their fridge and freezer at a required temperature. They also have to keep a TV on for six hours a day and a computer on for eight hours. Hot water is the seventh contest. Several times throughout the competition, students must deliver 15 gallons of 110 degree water in 10 minutes. Next comes lighting, the eighth contest. To win this contest, teams have to supply plenty of light with as little electricity as possible. The ninth contest is energy balance. All the electricity used in the competition must come from sunlight. The goal is for teams to have as much energy in their batteries at the end of the competition as they did at the beginning. And last of all, the tenth contest, Getting Around, requires the teams to power a solar electric car. Teams are rewarded for driving the most miles each day. Each of these individual contests is worth 100 points, except for architecture, which is worth 200. The team with the most overall points at the end of the competition wins the 2005 Solar Decathlon. Designing and building a house that can compete in all 10 of these contests takes years of hard work. Our school started the design process uh, with something called a charrette, which is where lots of students get together and they learn all about solar power, um, sustainable design, and we all brainstorm and we come up with all different ideas. That lasted for us about four days and then we broke up into teams and came up with our own ideas and had, you know, did drawings, did some diagrams and built little models. Most of the other decathlon teams started this same way, working together in groups to develop preliminary drawings and models. After the charrette, we held a little competition where four, four teams from our school showed their designs and professionals from the area and different professors came and saw our designs and chose one to be developed over the next two years. Competitions like these are a standard way of selecting the best design for buildings. Like many other schools, the California Polytechnic State University at San Luis Obispo, Cal Poly for short, also held a design competition. Their winning design was then developed further. More drawings and models were made. So this is what we started with. It was, this is the design that won the design competition. Uh, the main goal of it is, is it's simple. And from there, two architecture students spent all last quarter developing it into what we have over here. It's going to hopefully fit all on one trailer. It's 12 feet wide by 52 feet long, just over the 600 square feet that uh, NREL says that we need. Photovoltaics here tilted up on top. It's just a small little building, a little kitchen on the side, everything you could need. We take this design, we come up with a model of it, a mathematical model of it, 
we go through simulations in order to figure out how they're going to work ahead of time. So by the time we build it, we know exactly what's going to happen, or at least we have a pretty good idea. There's always errors in these models, but hopefully we're pretty close. Cal Poly was donated many things, including a chassis from a mobile home on which to build their house. A place was then selected on campus to begin construction. It was a former softball field that was just downwind of the dairy unit. It was a very funny site, but we had a lot of room uh, to spread out, which was nice. It was a very large site for that matter, and uh, it was good for the most part until the winds changed, then it got a little interesting. The chassis originally came with wheels and its own hitch, and those were removed. It was then insulated with some rigid insulation and soy-based foam insulation. And then covered, the deck was then covered up, and we had ourselves a, a level surface to build upon. Uh, and then came the structural insulated panels, also called SIPs for short. And they're essentially an ice cream sandwich of styrofoam in the middle between two skins of oriented strand board. And uh, that's what made up the envelope of the house, so we ended up with a very well insulated envelope. Here stands. Those will be arrayed underneath the building so that it'll have lots and lots of points of contact with the ground so that we have a dry run. We're going to go ahead and drop the building onto the piers that it'll, it'll rest on in Washington, make sure the whole system works, make sure we know how to put those on and take them off. about as far as we got before it was time to begin to take the house back apart again and get ready to transport it uh, out to Washington DC. We were not able to get all of the finished materials up and we weren't able to test all the systems. The solar hot water system still had never been tested. The HVAC system had never been tested. There were a lot of unknowns at this point uh, that we had yet to figure out once we arrived in Washington DC. The next morning, with the trailer only three inches above the road, the truck began the 3,000-mile journey to Washington, D.C. Seventeen other schools from the United States, Canada, Puerto Rico, and Spain would meet one week later on the National Mall at midnight to begin construction of the Solar Village. The parade of trucks of different sizes and shapes continued for hours. Some, like the truck from the Virginia Polytechnic Institute and State University, gave a glimpse of their team's style, but most schools kept things under wraps. As soon as they arrived, the teams set to work unloading and assembling their homes. Another, well, we have to be done by eight, so what time we Five, we have three more hours to get it done. We'll be done. Because all the cranes have to be off every every site. All the cranes have to be off by eight o'clock tonight. I don't know why these schools taking so long. The teams were given one week to complete their houses before the start of the competition. Cal Poly had one of the simplest designs. Many of the other homes were much more complicated and sometimes required unusual construction techniques. We are, the whole roof uh, is on a hinge system uh, designed by a Colorado architect. Uh, and the roof is hinging up. Oh. And we have to do it to all four sections of the house, raise the roof up. Ready? Set. Up. One. Two. Three. They're actually quite quite light. They're only Ready. about 300, the whole roof section is only about 300 pounds each. So with that many people, it makes it quite light. 
It was a long week, with the teams often working over 16 hours a day to complete their homes and install their solar equipment, like the photovoltaic panels which would turn sunlight into electricity. Solar thermal panels were also installed to heat water with sunlight. At last, the fateful day arrived. With Puerto Rico leading the way, the teams assembled for the opening ceremony. Speeches were made, and the Secretary of Energy cut the ribbon, signaling the official start of the 2005 Solar Decathlon. Something else arrived on opening day, rain, an unwelcome sight for many of the teams. Solar panels harvest much less energy from the sun on cloudy days. The weather didn't dampen the team's enthusiasm for giving house tours, however, as they welcomed the public into their homes and showed how the sun can be used to power a house. Powered. Everything runs off of the sun. You, you don't have to pay for any of your electricity. Those big panels up on top, that's what makes everything in this house work. All the appliances, the refrigerator, the washing machine, the everything. With their homes complete, the teams prepare for the 10-part competition. The first contest, architecture, is also the most important, worth 200 points, twice as much as any other contest. Inspecting the houses in the rain was more than the judges had planned for. And interestingly, we were judging these in uh, torrential rain, and they all were working just fine because they had battery systems that had been collecting uh, solar rays over the last uh, few days and turning them into electricity. We climbed up onto the roof and looked at gardens. There were some that had very intricate uh, wastewater systems on the outsides of the houses, and the students had done a tremendous job of, of thinking about all of the systems inside and out. When the judges' decisions were posted, Virginia Tech had taken first place in both the architecture and the dwelling contests. Surprisingly, Virginia Tech's unusual house was actually designed to take advantage of the rain, collecting it and using it for drinking water. The house also used a living machine, a series of boxes containing plants that filtered wastewater from the house. We have a rainwater catchment, which is our primary source of potable water for the home. It comes off the roof and then it falls into the grate, which is stored into a basin. The water goes through a UV light and a carbon filter. So then the water from there will be used in the house and the gray water will be recycled um, through the systems of the house, and that's water such as your dishwasher water, your laundry water, um, your shower. In addition to catching rainwater, the roof angled the solar panels towards the sun. On the inside, it made the house feel bigger and let in soft, natural daylight without adding the sun's heat. We treat our ceiling actually as one light fixture. We try to use as much natural daylight as possible. The translucent walls acted like a greenhouse, providing ample solar heat on cloudy days. To avoid overheating on sunny days, the walls used a special feature. Even on a uh, cloudy day like today, you can see it uh, offers a fair amount of uh, bright light, but uh, you can imagine how bright it would be on a, an intense sunny day. So we incorporated a shade device inside to uh, allow the, uh, the people in the home to be able to control the uh, quality of light. The Pittsburgh Synergy team also used a translucent wall, this time on the north side of the house where overheating is not a problem. Uh, this is extruded polycarbonate. We've used it on the exterior of the house on the north side. You can see that there's a very nice daylight quality to it, a lot of um, natural daylight coming in. And so it really opens up that very small space, but at the same time it's and also very cost efficient. It's an R9 value. It's much better than glass, where you have like an R5. I mean, yeah, you can get a window for R10, but you're not going to get it at $8 a square foot. Unlike the other teams, Puerto Rico used hot water in most of the systems of their house. We decided to have hot water as a very important um, concept to the design, design of the house. We have 80 vacuum tubes so that we have a high efficiency in heating water. Actually, we depend too much because of uh, our heating system depends solely on solar, solar uh, hot water. And uh, also our dryer, will, it depends totally on hot water. This works by sending um, hot water to a heat exchanger which then heats up the air that's coming into the dryer to dry the clothes. 
On sunny days, our collector system can bring uh, water up to 200 degrees Fahrenheit, which is quite good for uh, for our dryer to dry clothes. Actually, we only needed 160 degrees, so we're hoping that if we get any uh, sunny days later on, we, we will be able to show off this equipment uh, to everybody else. The evacuated tube solar thermal collectors are a very effective way to harvest the sun's heat and were used by several teams, including the University of Maryland, Washington State University, and the University of Texas at Austin. Because it's efficient, very efficient to convert sunlight to thermal energy and then keep it as thermal energy or heat. Um, there's actually no water in our solar hot water system. Inside the tubes is a copper fin. The fin contains alcohol, which becomes a gas when it heats up. That rises into this opaque manifold at the top. Inside there, there's a copper pipe, and the copper pipe um, contains antifreeze, the same sort of antifreeze that somebody might use in a car. Um, that heats to 350 degrees. That's super hot, so that's why it's insulated in that um, in that large pipe. So when you touch it, you wouldn't get you wouldn't get burned. None of this would get hot, so that's why I can touch it right now. That moves to our water storage tank. Um, that's for uh, space heating needs. We have a radiator with a fan behind it. That's a fan coil unit, and that's how we heat the space. Blowing air over hot water pipes is just one way the teams kept their houses warm on cloudy days. The University of Maryland ran hot water through pipes in the floor and let that heat radiate into the room. Crowder College took a different approach, running hot water through the ceiling instead. Our radiant system is on the ceiling of our house. Just like the sun radiates heat through the vacuum of space down to the earth, we can radiate heat from the ceiling. So it's not like convection heat where it's going to rise and stay at our ceiling level. It is going to actually go from the hotter source down to the cooler source. We can actually put cold water through these tubes as well to absorb the radiant heat out of the house. There's going to be more heat at the top of the ceiling. It's kind of like an air conditioning unit where you're not really putting cold air into the house, but you're taking the heat out of the air. We like to use our house to show people that you don't have to give up a lot of luxuries to live a solar lifestyle. Um, we, we have the wine chiller, we have a whirlpool tub in the bathroom, we have heated tile in the bathroom that's actually set on a programmable thermostat so that we can turn it on, say, 15 minutes before you wake up in the morning. You never have to walk across cold tile when you get up. Many other team bathrooms were as striking and innovative as their houses. Throughout the bathroom, we really want to emphasize water efficiency. So we went ahead and chose a lot of low flush and low flow appliances. Even the toilet, it's pretty common in Europe, but it has two flush settings, a half flush or a whole flush, just depending on your flushing needs. We really were conscientious about all the decisions regarding the materials we made. So the, the floor tile, for example, um, it actually has a really high recycled content. It's made out of recycled glass. And the material that's used um, as a screen throughout the house, as well as the walls in the bathroom here, it's actually um, made out of recycled plastic. It's a resin material. We like its uh, light quality and its architectural feature quality. Um, one of my favorite things about this kitchen is the granite countertop. It's a quarter inch of granite um, it looks solid, but it's over an aluminum honeycomb. This is a material that's used uh, mostly in the outside of skyscrapers. We have an induction cooktop. This is a very cool stove where, um, not only cool in the sense that it's awesome, but cool in the sense that it actually doesn't get hot. If you are cooking on it, it uses an induction process. You can use cast iron or stainless steel pots and they get hot, but this surface stays cool. So you can always touch it, you don't have to worry about it. If there's kids in the house, they don't have to worry about um, burning themselves on the stove. Like several other schools, the Texas team used natural air currents to cool their house. So you can see, for example, when the doors are open to the south and the windows open in the bedroom, it actually provides cross ventilation, drawing air through the house and creating a nice breeze through the house. And if the house gets a little bit too warm, you can go ahead and open up the clear story windows up there and actually it creates stack ventilation where the hot air that's rising is sucked out through the house and goes out those windows. And if the ceiling fans are going around, it actually helps in that process helping to draw the air out through the space. Although preparing meals was part of the competition, some teams, like Cornell University, took it a step further and actually grew their own food. We thought that there's a much more effective way of using a lawn or using your, your, your landscape in front of your house. So if we're going to go for sustainability in the house itself, how do we get sustainability out of your site? 
we felt that one of the best ways to do it would be to use a productive garden. Now, if you look at our entire landscape, it's about 1,300 square feet of planted material for eating. And that provides about as much food as you need for one person for one year. We have a pretty broad, broad range. We wanted to do that to provide not only some ornamental textures and some qualities, but we also wanted to provide a full range of nutritional value in the system as well. So here we have the thermal mass on the ground. Inside Cornell's house, concrete in the floor behind a window acted as thermal mass, heating up in the day to keep the room warm at night. Other teams used different forms of thermal mass to store heat. Cal Poly had a black painted water tank in a wall behind a window. During winter, the sun is low in the sky and shines directly onto the water tank. The sun heats the water during the day, and in the evening, this heat radiates into the room. The awning is made of solar panels that shade the tank during summer days when the sun is higher in the sky. Now the cool tank of water keeps the house from overheating. The Canadian team used bricks under the floor. These bricks show how thermal mass can store both heat and coolness. Say we're in July, okay? We're expecting a cool sort of evening and night, and then the next day we want to air condition. So we have a very large fan out in the back that sucks in these huge volumes of air that you just pass underneath the floor and go over the bricks. There's bricks the entire length of the house. Cooler outside air is blown over the bricks and as the evening progresses, they cool down. By the next day, you have to air condition your house. So what we do is we take the air from the space that's getting heated up by occupants or just by the sun beaming in. That's sucked into the floor, passes over these bricks which are cooler and then the air temperature drops by a good 6 to 8 Fahrenheit. The air blowing across the bricks cools before reaching the air conditioner, in this case a heat pump. And the heat pump finishes the job, but now it has less cooling to do, so it lightens the, the electrical load on it and it lightens the wear and tear. The Michigan team used air flowing through the walls to both heat and cool their house. Outside air enters at the bottom of the wall, is warmed by the sun and rises into the living space. This type of passive solar heating system moves air through the building without using fans. It's called a solar chimney. The Spanish team took advantage of the large amount of heat released when materials change from a liquid to a solid. Those are the phase changing gels, and the way they work is when it is hot, they absorb the heat becoming liquid, and when it's cold, they release the heat becoming solid. So that's why they're phase changing, but they keep their temperature. As the competition continues, a panel of judges inspects the lighting design in each house. Teams are required to keep lights at a certain level. They also must continue washing and drying clothes. The card is facing out and it looks like we've, we've got all our temperatures. We need 110 and it looks like we've got it, so that's happiness. With only two days before the final scoring and Virginia Tech still in the lead, the University of Colorado jumped from fifth to second place pushing Cal Poly back into third. By nightfall, Colorado had moved into first place, having driven their electric car 80 miles that day. The University of Colorado called their house the Bioship because of the many natural materials used in its construction. The list read like a health food menu, including corn, soy, wheat, and even chocolate. We call this house the Bioship, and the reason for that is that we tried to incorporate bio-based materials into it as much as possible. Bio-based means plants, and outside you would find plants that uh, represent materials that you'll find in our house. We have a soy plant and we have soy-based insulation. This, this green material here is a replacement to a concrete block. It's called fast wall. It's crunched up shipping pallets and concrete mixed together. And all the little air pockets that creates actually gives it a higher insulation value than a normal concrete block. Our walls are made out of this. We call this the BioSIP. And we actually developed these ourselves. Uh, this product right here is called SaunaBoard. It's engineered molded fiber, and it's made from recycled paper. This is commercially available. This right here is soy-based foam insulation, and this is commercially available, but putting them together is something that we did. All of our plastic silverware is corn-based, and our bedding is made out of corn fiber. The window sill behind the, this window here is a sunflower shell window sill. It's just crunched up sunflowers with glue compressed down. All the different grasses, the seeds from those grasses create the, the glues for a floor. We have a, a cork and seed floor essentially that 
um, looks like linoleum, but it doesn't have any petroleum in it. We also have our solar electric array. That's a um, big part of the competition. We have 34 panels made by SunPower and it's a 6.8 kilowatt array. It's a very large array for a residential system. Even for a house twice this big, that would be a very large array, but that's the competition. So we have a real large solar array. We have 40 batteries, also very large. So we have a lot of great solar systems and they are definitely being used to the maximum right now since we, uh, since we have no sun and we're trying to optimize everything as much as possible. Not all teams had solar electric systems as large as Colorado's. Cal Poly had a much smaller battery bank and only 4.9 kilowatts of solar panels. The Missouri Rolla team also had a smaller system and combined their solar electric panels with their solar thermal panels, running hot water pipes through their copper roof behind flexible photovoltaic panels. Instead of batteries, the New York Institute of Technology used a fuel cell to store energy. This is the hydrogen generator. This is actually what's taking the water and power from the photovoltaic panels and turning it into hydrogen gas. Electricity from their solar panels was used to split water into hydrogen and oxygen. Later, the hydrogen could be recombined with oxygen to create water and electricity. The New York house was divided into two sections, one called the green machine and the other the blue space. The green machine is made from a recycled shipping container. Um, there's abundance of these um, all over the world, so we felt that we would recycle one of these, creating our green machine, which has our roof garden, our kitchen, our bathroom and our hydrogen regenerative system. So the green machine is a, is a deployable unit that houses the processes of life. If you want to go over to the blue space, the blue space is our living area. It has the, the dining area, a living area, a workstation, and an entertainment. Wall construction is made from agarboard. It's a compressed wheat straw insulation. So it's, uh, it's very environmentally friendly. Um, over here you can see a section cut in the wall which shows the actual insulation material. All of our furniture within the space was designed by our students at the New York Institute of Technology. They create microclimates within the architecture. So instead of heating or cooling the entire space, we're going to heat and cool the specific areas where people would occupy. So our couch, for example, which is really exciting, has a solar panel system mounted on the back of it. It, it collects the ambient light and stores it in batteries within the couch. The couch has a heating element and a fan unit, so when you're hot or you're cold, you could sit down and the warm air or the cool air could come through these, these cushions, which are made from recycled plastics, and there's task lighting, so you don't need to turn on light within the whole space, you could just use the task light. This table, it folds up, but when you want to eat dinner, you can open it up, fold the chair, and the, the silverware is actually stored within here. Our kitchen is very small, but we, we've, we've taken alternate um, solutions to storing. Washington State University also used a recycled shipping container as part of their house. The core of our house here uh, is a 20-foot shipping container. It houses all of the mechanical, electrical, and plumbing systems. It's the center of our house in that way as well as in structure. All of the uh, rest of the structure of the house is run off of it. The Washington team paid particular attention to making their house usable for people with disabilities. Shelves and storage systems were built lower to the ground or could be pulled down for use by people in wheelchairs. Like Washington State, most of the Decathlon houses had their longest side facing the south to get as much sunlight as possible. One exception was the house from RISD, the Rhode Island School of Design. To show that solar power could be used even in crowded city blocks, the RISD house faced their shortest side to the south. It was designed as a townhouse. Um, we were oriented uh, 90 degrees to everybody else. The, the skin of the house are perforated aluminum louvers to reflect the heat off the building. So they slowly track the sun during the day. They're on small servos. It's almost like mechanical trees we've built that provide shading during the day. Um, in the winter time, these louvers open up and reflect light onto the house, so they sort of work in reverse, and that cut our air conditioning load in half, which uh, afforded a smaller array, which afforded us the roof garden, etc. Passive solar design is essentially the orientation of the building, taking advantage of the path of the sun. So this house is, is, is oriented north-south, so really the south end is where we're going to collect the most sun, sunlight. And so these cafe style doors are, are designed for the low winter sun to bring it deep into the floor plan 
and it's set back again so we knock out the summer sun. The Florida House used small wooden slats or louvers called light shelves to control sunlight. They let indirect light come into the house, but not direct light. What happens when the sun rays hits the uh, light shelves, the light comes in, but the heat does not. The heat bounces off and is absorbed. Okay, this is natural daylighting. This window right here is really special. It's actually a solar panel. It's also a shading device. 10% of the light, the heat, comes in here. Also, it's a projection screen. You put this all across your, your backyard, or across your sink, your uh, sliding glass doors, and you can project the game right here oh and watch God. it. On the last day of the competition, the teams gathered for a final lap around the mall, the last event before the announcement of the overall winners. As if on cue, the sun did begin to shine as the students finished their final lap and assembled for the announcement of the winners. If you look at this year's decathlon, you see how we've built on the success of the first one. The podium set up at the bioship signaled the crowds that the University of Colorado had taken first place overall. Cornell University beat Cal Poly out of second place. Still, Cal Poly successfully completed more contest tasks than any other team. They were very consistent in spite of having one of the smallest PV arrays here. Please join me in congratulating our third place winners, the team from Cal Poly. Uh, thank you everyone, we'd like to congratulate Obviously, Colorado for a job well done on their first place. And, and I, I also wanted to put a word out to a team like NYIT who's using something as, as daring as a fuel cell, a hydrogen fuel cell as a storage medium. I think that shows a lot of courage. And just all these awesome, innovative designs. I'm going to shamelessly borrow all the good ones I see. So, thanks again. Well, let's congratulate back-to-back -back champions of the Solar Decathlon, the University of Colorado. I think this competition, particularly this one in 2005, really proved that solar power can work. We had no direct sunlight for the last week. And despite that, teams were washing clothes, washing dishes, running air conditioners, and doing everything that a normal household would, would do. If it can work this week, it can work anywhere in the world right now. And solar energy is here today. Let's celebrate that. The teams had one last gloriously sunny weekend at the National Mall before disassembling their homes and transporting them to their final destinations. The bioship became a private home in Longmont, Colorado. The Crowder College House, the only entry from a community college, returned to the Missouri campus to become a research center for renewable technology. The Maryland House was donated to the Red Wiggler Community Farm, a nonprofit training adults with developmental disabilities. The University of Massachusetts at Dartmouth donated their house to the Habitat for Humanity program. And Cal Poly, after traveling the longest land distance of any school, returned to San Luis Obispo. The house became a research laboratory for renewable energy on the Cal Poly campus, helping train the next generation of students to harness the energy of our nearest star, the sun.
Like the other teams, Santa Clara University, the California team for the 2007 Solar Decathlon, used sunlight to generate electricity and to heat water. Like some other teams, they used that hot water to heat their building. But they were one of the first teams to use hot water to cool their building. This is sort of our most innovative feature, yet it's very, uh, very simple. Um, what it is, is um, in an air conditioning unit, that instead of using electricity, it uses hot water. Um, the way this works is we have thermal collectors on the roof that collect very hot water. And this hot water is then stored in a hot water tank. Um, we use that hot water to heat our house, heat our water for our uh, showers or appliances and whatnot, but also to cool our house. Um, the way we cool the house is with this uh, very innovative machine called an absorption chiller. What this machine does is it takes uh, hot water, uh, mixes in lithium bromide salts, and that brings down the temperature of the water to almost freezing temperature. This water is then run through a copper coil and you blow air through it and then you get air conditioning. So the beauty of this system is not only that it uses very little electricity, um, you know, air conditioning units are a huge power hog in homes. It's the reason why most uh, power grids go down during the summer is because everybody's running their air conditioning units. But it also works best the hotter it gets. So it's, it's ideal for uh, hot climates like California, Florida, um, Arizona, Texas, uh, because you know, the more heat you get, the more cooling you get. Santa Clara's house had other innovative features, such as electrochromatic windows that could darken to reduce heat gain. It also included extensive use of green building materials. Another one of the innovations in our house is the uh, bamboo I-beams uh, developed by Santa Clara University students and professors. These bamboo I-beams are a wood substitute and they're actually stronger than wood. Bamboo grows four times faster than wood, which means it takes uh, less, uh, four times less amount of land to grow it. It's also a grass, which means when you cut it, it maintains its root structure, therefore preventing soil erosion. Um, we use it in our flooring, in our cabinets. We use it actually uh, in, uh, in the bed sheets. We use it all around the house. The Santa Clara University house used far less energy for air conditioning than the other teams, and its bamboo structure consumed a fraction of the planet's resources compared to the wood-framed homes. This highlights a theme central to all the Decathlon teams, using energy and materials more efficiently. Being efficient is simply the art of doing more with less, and it is one of the most important elements of homes that are both kind to the environment and marketable to the public. The less energy and resources a home uses, for example, the cheaper it is to own and operate. The Decathlon market viability jurors had direct experience with these issues. In more recent years, we've been putting a lot of emphasis on getting the envelope of the, the buildings extremely efficient. We can do a whole lot on the energy side by cutting the demand first and then looking for these alternative energy sources to power what man demand still remains. Outside the photovoltaics, almost all the other technologies we can implement without adding substantial additional cost, if any. For very little or, or no additional cost, but changing your strategy in a few areas like insulation and windows and orientation of the house and shade, and those kind of items, we can cut the energy usage very quickly by 30 to 50 percent. And basically orientation of the house, that's free. Orientation is one of several solar decathlon principles that can be adopted by production home builders. Proper solar orientation positions a building to take full advantage of the sun's path across the sky. In the northern hemisphere, this path is angled to the south. During winter, the sun's path is even lower in the southern sky. Because of this, a building oriented with its longest side to the south receives more solar energy. By placing the majority of windows facing south, the sun more easily heats the building. Inside the home, dense materials like tile or stone can act as thermal mass, absorbing the sun's heat during the day to keep the house warm at night. Because they needed to be portable, many Decathlon homes developed innovative types of thermal mass, such as Penn State's water wall made of recycled milk bottles. Most of the insulation materials teams use to increase efficiency, like the structural insulated panels, are commercially available to production home builders. Another way production home builders can inexpensively reduce heating and cooling loads for homeowners is with properly sized roof overhangs that shade windows from the higher summer sun, yet still let the lower winter sun heat the building. Many teams used louvered light shelves for the same effect. Solar thermal systems are also very cost-effective, supplying hot water not just for cleaning and bathing, but also for space heating and ultimately for space cooling. These systems, when combined with the energy-efficient lighting and appliances of the solar decathlon, make supplying electricity with sunlight increasingly affordable. You start with the low-tech stuff first and get all the advantages you can, then infuse the technologies, and then we can really come out ahead in our day and time. And, you know, when, when a designer can figure out how to use one space for two functions, 
that's a that's a win, and that lets you be very efficient with your space. And that applies to you know these solar homes here or a commercial market. Boy, I loved the University of Maryland. Their back door was both a shower and the the tile from the shower extended into the foyer, and so this serves as a mudroom and a shower. And another f aspect that I really liked was the amount of storage. And I know from my career in multifamily construction that that's one of the things that, that people really look at when they look at model units is how much storage do people have. Another one that I gave very high marks was Penn State. In addition to all their high-tech features and so forth, they had a, um, a strong use of local materials. They had Pennsylvania bluestone, I believe, as the floor system they used as a heat sink to absorb the heat during the day. They had exquisite furniture and woodworking in the house made from trees reclaimed from the area you know, in and around their campus. Penn State made their living space even more efficient by using a moving wall, which could expand either the bedroom or the living and dining area, depending on the needs and moods of the occupants. To make maximum use of local materials, the Penn State team envisions shipping a production version of the core of the house to its final location. Living areas and bedrooms could be added to the core kitchen, bath, and mechanical components using local materials. The German team gave dual purpose and efficient use of space a new meaning. The Darmstadt team incorporated solar cells into the south, east, and west walls of the house, mounted on louvers that automatically follow the sun. Inside the home, the floor itself served dual purpose as both bedroom and living room. University of Illinois had a very interesting concept, and I remember the student explaining it to us. She got very excited, and she showed us how they built the main core of the house, and then she says, if you have a baby, you put this module on here, and if you have another baby, you put this module on here. Baby grows up, moves away, you take this module off. You don't have to heat and cool it anymore. You take this module off. And she was very, very clear and distinct at showing us the modularity of that house and how it could go into different modes to change with your changing needs. You could stay in the same house for a long time if you wanted to. You could make it bigger and smaller theoretically. They would even go so far as to have a community of these and you'd move that module down to somebody else that needs it down the, the road. So it's great modularity. We just need to see these things start making it to market in a, an easier fashion, but I can tell from looking at many, many of the designs that many want to see implemented the modularity concept. The Texas A&M team took the modularity concept a step further, developing a plug-and-play system with interchangeable wall units. Homeowners could easily swap the position of the kitchen and bath, buy an extra kitchen on eBay, or sell off a couple of rooms after the kids leave home. So this is just a fat wall, or a grow wall, and this gets latched onto the building itself. These guys all put in and ready to go as a grow wall unit. So each one of them has different things that go on them. So in fact, we have about 20 concepts going of what these grow walls could be. Some are gardens, some are wastewater treatment, some are exercise rooms, some of them are shops, some of them are stairs that go up to the second floor. There are all kinds of different grow walls that can modularly be done to fit into the system. So there's a kitchen, there's a bathroom, there's a bicycle exercise room. All these things are interchangeable. So you, be, you get a building very efficient in how it uses its space, almost like a boat. The system could provide rapid housing for disaster relief, incorporating components from discarded FEMA trailers. The modular homes could even become part of coordinated renewable energy neighborhoods, with neighbors buying, selling, and trading components as needed. As new teams prepare to compete in the next solar decathlon, production houses inspired by the last competition are entering the marketplace. The MK Lotus House, designed by Michelle Kaufman, is a prime example. Like some decathlon homes, it has a green roof to reduce heating and cooling loads and to catch rainwater for irrigating the sustainable landscaping. Household water use is greatly reduced by a gray water system that filters water from the sink and shower for use in the washing machine and toilet. Extensive use is made of recycled and eco-friendly materials, from the recycled glass tile in the shower to the eco-smart fireplace burning 100% clean alcohol. The house also has intelligent systems to monitor and control the lighting, heating, and entertainment systems. Efficiency is built into every aspect of the home, from the building envelope to the Energy Star appliances, to the window and door placements, and the solar thermal and electric systems. As one of the first in a new generation of solar homes, the MK Lotus House follows the tradition of the solar decathlon with beauty and elegance. It also inspires discussion of other issues surrounding widespread adoption of solar and energy-efficient housing. 
to bring this to, to the marketplace and make it the norm, I mean, I think it's going to take a huge commitment on, on the national leadership and the state levels on a variety of issues to bring it, to make it a reality. But it's also going to be an educational issue because you not only have the individuals, but you have building code officials. There's educational issues for the people who would live and operate these homes. I think the reality of this whole situation, this has the opportunity uh, to be the biggest economic change in our country probably in the next century. Uh, you know, we've had a century of oil and uh, maybe not meaning any harm, but gluttony with oil and, and it's time for the change. And I think the industries that get out front and can move this along uh, will enjoy a very nice economic benefit from it also. At the end of another competition, the achievements of the Solar Decathlon teams reveal compelling possibilities for a new solar future. Not too bad for the team that took 21st out of the 20 teams in the beginning. I was walking over here thinking if by some chance we were up here and I had to say something, what would I say? And I overheard a gentleman talking to his four-year-old son and he made this statement, I wrote it down, and it said, the most important thing in a competition is not to win, but to succeed. And I think today, and I am not just saying this because everyone says it, there are 20 teams, 20 houses out there that are living proof and testament to the fact that not only can college students succeed in one of the biggest challenges of our time, but that this is a new reality, and this is something very exciting, and you're gonna see a lot more of it, and go Solar Energy, thank you. Thank you.